this is our first conference on uh, the presence of God, first of five, and uh, we'll go ahead and begin with prayer. Uh, so we'll just stand and face the crucifix over here. For those who are listening online or watching online, um, I actually only have two people here in the room with me. So if you have questions that come up as you as you go along, please use the form that's in the in the video description to submit those. And uh, and Jason will give me those uh, at various points as we go along today. Okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And you can find the prayer on the, on the outline. Heavenly Father, we know that you are here, that you see us, that you hear us, that you are the deepest desire of our hearts and the source of all our good operations. We beg pardon for our sins and the grace to direct all of our actions, intentions, and operations purely to the praise and service of your divine majesty. Immaculate Conception, St. Joseph, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Timothy, and all our guardian angels, please intercede for us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Master is here. He is calling for you. This is the most important message and the invitation of these conferences. We'll use the relationship of Mary and Martha in the gospel, in the gospels to, uh, to find several lessons regarding the presence of God. So they had knowledge of God's presence and acted on faith in his word. So those are philosophical and theological aspects. That's today's conference, the first conference. Uh, they had faith which determined how they behave toward others, which is their ethical responsibility. Uh, so that will be the second conference next week on the moral implications. We'll also discuss sacraments then. They learned how to attend to the presence of God, to encounter him themselves. That would be the third conference on the presence of God in the stages of the spiritual life. They received Christ who came to them in their suffering. And that will be the fifth conference on the presence of God in the midst of evil. And then in addition to those, the fourth conference will be on the presence of Christ in the Eucharist and uh, why we call that the real presence. In that conference, we'll also discuss the person of Jesus and his presence in uh, the Blessed Virgin. If you uh, went to the philosophy seminars I had last summer, this will be quite a bit different. It'll be a more limited scope and uh, there will be less homework, uh, and it will, uh, it will be more, these will be more like talks rather than discussions. Uh, so if you're a note taker, <clears throat> I suggest that it's better to listen carefully and not write down everything, but maybe take note of, of one or two things here or there that may strike you unexpectedly. <clears throat> The summary of all the five conferences is that God is present always and everywhere in many ways. That our ultimate purpose and happiness is experiencing his presence directly with no omissions or intermissions and no intermediary, and that is heaven. The prelude to that is regarding created things as God regards them, loving others as he loves them, participating in the inner life of God through the activity of the church, and stretching out to God in complete abandonment of our minds, hearts, and wills to him. So today's outline for the first conference it will be in two parts, uh, and it will we'll have a philosophical approach, and we'll discuss what is presence, because in order to, if we're talking about presence of God, we need to know first what presence means. Then we'll have the theological approach, which is to enrich the philosophical conception of God's presence by the addition of scripture and tradition. The talk won't proceed like a clear cut outline uh, so much as like a sequence of topics, but more like a spiral or like waves. So I'll be returning to the same thing like waves. 
So uh, getting into that first part, what is presence? The first thing to note is that presence is, uh, as we say in philosophy, presence is always bipolar. It is always presence of something to someone. And uh, a little bit of the intention, the terminology that we use, that we'll use a little bit, I'm tr gonna try not to use too much technical terms, but a few things will be helpful for us. So first is the idea of intentionality. Intentionality just means mentally attending to a concept of something. And my example right here is the podium. Okay, so I have an idea of the podium. I'm mentally attending to it. I have a concept of it. So fulfillment is the degree to which that intentionality is occasioned by immediate evidence and perception. So if I have a fulfilled intentionality, in other words, I can see, hear, smell, taste, or touch the podium or, or part of it, then I say it's present. If it's, if, if I, I'm thinking about it, but I'm, it's not in my perceptual stream, then I have an empty or an unfulfilled intentionality. It's absent, okay? My car is, I know it's in the parking lot, at least I think, I hope it's still in the parking lot. Um, so I, I have an intentionality of it, I have a concept of it, but it's not fulfilled right now by perceptual evidence at all. So things come to us in blends of presence and absence, right? I can. Uh, the, the podium, I can see it and feel it, but I can't see and feel all of it. If I try to go around and see the parts that I wasn't seeing a moment ago, a moment ago then some of it is going to go out of my perceptual stream, right? So we have this, this blends of partial presence and absence. So going with that, the first kind of presence we can talk about is objective presence. So this is going to be... Like I said, presence is presence of something to someone, okay? So here, I'm not going to try to draw a podium. I'm just going to draw a box and write a P in it for the podium, right? So on the subjective side, the subject, I'm the subject, okay? And then here is the object. On the subjective side, I have an intentionality which is fulfilled by sensory experience or sensory intuition, you might say. So in, on the subjective side, the object matters to me. I'm, I'm necessarily changed in some way by experiencing the object. It's in a particular context with me here and now, and that is essential to my consideration of it, if it's present. Now, when the object is absent, I can think of it in possible contexts, but when I'm thinking of it as absent, like my car, it, that my, my consideration of it doesn't determine it to one of those. But when it's here in front of me, my idea of the podium is determined to a particular state, a particular color, a particular configuration, orientation, et cetera. Now, on the objective side, in this kind of presence, I don't matter to the podium, right? The podium doesn't have an intentionality towards me. The podium isn't necessarily changed by coming into contact, contact with my perceptual stream. Now, if I start kicking it and throwing it around or scribbling on it with a marker, then it might. But, but otherwise, it, doesn't, it isn't necessarily changed, okay? So now we can go up another level from, from objective presence to intersubjective presence, okay? And I'm just gonna name this person A, and this person is B, okay? Now, rather than having a subject and an object, I have two subjects. I have subject A, and subject B. Okay, subject is just is the one that, that is doing an action, all right? In, in this case, that is having or can have some kind of intentionality. So 
in intersubjective presence, I'm recognizing the presence of another being to whom I can be present. So what are the ways that a person can be more or less present that, doesn't, that don't apply to an object? So we can say, uh, so-and-so was here, but they weren't really present, right? Or they can be present to a certain degree. You might be talking to them, they might be vaguely aware of you and not listening to you. Or the other way around, they might be talking to you and you are absorbed in a book uh, or, or something like that and not being completely present to them. So the presence stretches beyond these, uh, beyond what we might think of as sort of the physical characteristics into things that we, that even though they're revealed by our bodies, they're revealed physically, they are deeper than that. So there's a difference with a person, there's a difference between being there and being present. So we could give a few illustrations to highlight the complex layers of presence, uh, of intersubjective presence. So just think about these for a second and how the two people in these situations may be more or less present to one another. A priest and a penitent in the confessional. Two teammates throwing a baseball, talking about their hopes and predictions for the current baseball season. A plantation owner punishing a slave. An elderly couple drinking coffee together on the porch, watching the sun rise in silence. A parent sitting at a computer, ignoring a child's pleas to play together. A young couple sitting in bed, he lost in a book, and she in silent anguish, feeling unable to communicate some pain that's in her heart. A lawyer and a prosecutor negotiating a plea deal. A man and woman standing at the foot of the sanctuary, pronouncing their wedding vows to one another with a joyful and peaceful solemnity. So in all of these, we can see that there are different degrees and different kinds of, of ways that people can be present or not to another. In the slave example, a person who is being treated as a slave is being treated more like an object, right? So we can see that intersubjective presence has possibilities infinite, infinitely deeper than objective. And I'm gonna give four pairs of contraries to illustrate uh, some of the ways these can be. So respect and disrespect, or regard and disregard. So respect is to consider the other as they are, it's grounded in truth. Disrespect, considering the other as something other than they are, as less than I am, considering them purely according to objective presence, or perhaps ignoring them altogether. Action and passion. Action, external actions to affect the other. Passion, being affected by the action of another. Or not. Equal or contrary desires. Equal desires, there's, there's a union of ends. There's a sense of community and camaraderie on the journey. And approval of the other's goal and happiness in seeing the other attain their goal. In, with equal desires, the two move closer to each other as they approach the goal. But if there are contrary desires, there are differing ends, and there's a sense of conflict, tendency, and the tendency there is to pull apart as each approaches their own goal. And then the fourth way, the fourth uh, set of contraries, communication and understanding. In communication, I attempt to convey to the other some fact or desire and I seek some sign that they understand. With understanding, I take in what the other conveys to me and offer some sign that I understand. And in understanding, I'm not just talking about facts about a person, because somebody could just report to me on that without actually them being in my presence, but actually the content of another person's intentionality, how they see me, how they see uh, the, how they experience and understand the world, um, but really especially how they experience and understand me in their presence. 
And here we can see that intersubjective presence in its fullness stretches out towards union. But for that union, that requires respect or regard on the part of both. It's not sufficient just for one. And what I'm talking about with union here, this is not just equality of desires, but achievement, actual achievement of the ultimate goal. And it would involve perfect and, communi and complete communication so that nothing is left to be said because both understand one another completely. Of course, on a natural level, this kind of union is impossible because as long as we are encountering another, there is more of the other to know, there is more of myself to give. But there is a being for whom it is not just possible but necessary. And that would be, that would be God, of course. So that brings us to our, our last and third kind of, of presence here. I'm gonna get rid of objective for a second here. In divine presence, God knows himself. And it's really, it's, it, it's somewhat incorrect. There's not a way to really to draw this. But God knows and loves himself completely and eternally with no intermission, with, with nothing more to learn and with nothing held back. And we can contrast this with intersubjective presence because in intersubjective, there is always a substantial distinction between these two. A and B will always still be A and B, no matter how close they get. Whereas in divine, uh, in divine presence, in God's presence to himself, there is no substantial distinction between the knower and the known. These are the same. These are so close that they come into one. And we find this in the Holy Trinity. In the Trinity, we have a multiplicity of relations, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but there is no distinction among them in their substance, in their, in their, ed in their essence. Right? We say in the, in the Nicene Creed, consubstantial with the Father. Right? They're the same substance, yet they are still distinct. Um, so... In the Trinity, there is one God, and what he knows is the same as what he is. And we actually don't need revelation in order to figure this out. This goes back to Aristotle, 2,400 years ago, who showed just through reason that the prime mover is the highest of all beings, that he's the source of being, and that really what he knows is himself. Now, St. Thomas adds, and we know this by revelation as well, that in knowing himself, God knows all of his effects. And Revelation also adds that God actually loves us as well, that he loves all of his creation. And Aristotle, on the other hand, said uh, that the distance between the divine beings and us is so great that there that the divine beings would have no concern for us at all they would not deign to think of us they would be occupied in thoughts of the highest things only but we know that the trinity is the source of any possibility of presence that it is the highest form of presence that it is the ultimate union towards which all forms all other forms of presence tend so but a difficulty here is, how do we know God's presence? God is not fulfilled in perceptual experience like created things are, right? We can't walk outside and turn the corner and recognize God standing there, at least not in the way we can a person. No concept we have is adequate to God's essence. No word we can use adequately communicates his essence or his substance. But Aquinas demonstrates that we can know God by causality, because we know that there must be a first cause as the ultimate cause of all the things that we encounter in the world. Causality, the second way is negation. We look at things we encounter and know that they are not God. 
And by transcendence, we grasp certain things like goodness, beauty, perfection, and union in created things, and know that God is something like them, but infinitely beyond any way that we understand them. And then one other thing to note in, in divine presence, to God, all things that have been, that are, and that will be are present at the same time. So whereas with for a um, a fulfilled a, a fulfilled intentionality for us, in other words, for th something to be present to us, that requires perceptual experience, right? I can't have my my car can't be present to me, except by analogy, perhaps, it, unless I unless I see it. For God, all intentionality is fulfilled because. He knows all things at once through and through. He doesn't need to find out anything about anything. So that completes our articulation of the three basic kinds of presence, objective, intersubjective, and divine. So um, at this point, are, do we have any questions before we go on? Yeah. Yeah. So the 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 question is about with Saint Paul and with Saint Thomas Aquinas and with many other saints that we know of, they had an experience of God that was beyond that that was supernatural that was mystical, right? And um, so the answer to that is is going to come out through the next <laughs> through the next five weeks. Um, so uh, so so yes, it is it is sort of divine presence and intersubjective presence because we're going to be drawn up into into divine presence. Okay. So now we're going to go on to our second wave, and now we're going to. Now that we know something about divine presence, we're going to talk about the implications of that on the other kinds of presence. And here we're going to break down the objective and the objective presence into different kinds of things. So we can talk about inanimate objects. We can say God is in all things. St. Thomas says God is in all things. And uh, the verse that comes to mind here is from Gerard Manley Hopkins' poem, God's Grandeur. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. Think of uh, how electricity, how a, a piece of metal can be charged. So God is not in things as part of their essence. That would be pantheism. That would be saying that all things are God. But as St. Thomas says, as an agent is present to that upon which it works. So God is always working in some way on all things. He's in all things, not as a body himself, but by giving them their existence, giving them their power, giving them their operation. So we can see now that creation is an ongoing thing here and now, not a one-time event in the past. We can also say all things are good. They have the goodness of existence. If nothing else, they have the goodness of existence, anything that is created. They are good in following the laws God has laid out for them to the extent they do. So imputing pure evil, complete evil to anything or anyone is thinking not as God does, but as man does. Nothing and nobody is pure evil. So the third thing we'll say about inanimate objects and any material objects, really, everything has a part in God's plan, in his, in his providence. So next, on living things, God's presence in plants, in giving them life. What is life? Life is like the, uh, the ability to, to draw things to oneself, right? We, we take in things around us to grow. 
So all living things and plants are the lowest level of this have life. Animals, animals have also the power of sensing and interacting more deeply with the world. They have the power of imagination and the ability to experience pleasures and other goods through sensation and imagination. Now, what about man? What about myself? So God is present in me. God is present in you in the ways he is present in inanimate objects and all other living things. In other words, he is working on you just by your existence and being here. He is giving you life, but preeminently by the light of reason, which God actively sustains in us. So what are some examples of reason's activity in us that God, uh, that God makes possible? It's learning by discovery, like when the light of reason shines on our experience of the world and we learn things by discovery. Learning by being taught, where we can understand what we've not experienced or understand what we have experienced even more deeply than before. And really, perhaps most importantly, apprehending something as a good, because this is necessary for us to desire it, to pursue it, to achieve it, and then ultimately to rest in the happiness of attaining it. Uh, and God is present as the object of our operations. In other words, when, when we love him, okay, when, he, when we desire him, when we love him, when he's the object of our operations. So now this can give rise to a humility with regard to God, recognizing that all that is good in myself comes from God. Anything that is evil in myself comes from me. The more God is at work in oneself, the less of what one does is of oneself and the more of God. Growing in humility towards God then means that what God is, that what is of God is amplified beyond measure and what is of oneself recedes to nothing. The psalmist says, my life is as nothing in your sight. In the book of wisdom, for even if one is perfect among the sons of men, yet without the wisdom that comes from you, he will be regarded as nothing. The book of Daniel, all the inhabitants of earth are accounted as nothing. And then in, in uh, the gospel of John, two passages here, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. And then John the Baptist saying of Jesus, he must increase and I must decrease. On the other hand, we have the virtue of magnanimity as an accompanying virtue to humility. And this is a, a kind of generosity toward God by stretching out toward doing great things with his strength and not with ours. St. Paul says, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. Uh, the communion antiphon from today, actually, uh, from the Gospel of John again. I have chosen you from the world, says the Lord, and have appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. So now we can turn to uh, intersubjective presence and how God is present to us in others. We can have a deeper notion of respect, recognizing these ways of God's presence in another. That is all of the ways that God is present in me that we just talked about. He is present in another. And all of the ways that God is present in another are good. So we can begin to recognize the many ways that others are good. It's a, an occasion for humility toward others. Aquinas says that our humility toward others grows out of comparing what is of God in them to what is of me in myself. Comparing what is of God in another with what is of me in myself. That's where we get humility and we marvel at the goodness of God in others. Now, how about God himself, our experience of God himself in the world? Everything we encounter at every moment in every way 
is teeming with the activity of God and is present to God. So with regard to all created things, we must have regard, the proper respect for them in light of God's activity. Nothing is a pure tool just for our sake. All things are for God, but just temporarily at our disposal. So if, if somebody else were up here and were acting on this, poem, on this podium, I would have regard for their activity, right? I, I hope I would. Um, now, so it is with God and all things. With all things that we encounter and have at all times, God is working on them. How do I regard God's activity in this thing? Is it just for me, or is it, is it for God? Am I regarding his activity? Um, so we can, we can turn that into a meditation, really. You can choose any object and just marvel that God is, even now, creating and sustaining it. That God only allows that thing to exist as part of his plan, as part of his will. And that at the beginning of time, God had in mind that you would be considering that thing and that at that moment, he willed that you right now would be brought to thought of him. So then we can thank him for that thing, whatever it is, because at that moment, it led you to God. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, all else be not to me, save that thou art, as the hymn says. And I'll, I'll just make a brief reference here to uh, what's referred to as the ladder of beauty from Plato's dialogue, the symposium, which I, I, I thought of when I was going through this. There are six rungs on this ladder of beauty from the symposium where he starts out from love of one particular material thing, recognizing in it something choice worthy, to going to love for all material things, recognizing in all of them something wonderful. Then love for souls, recognizing that what is immortal is more lovable than what is perishable. Then love for laws and institutions that formed people into beautiful souls. Then going from that to love for knowledge itself, recognizing that in all things everywhere there is limitless knowledge. And then finally, love for the beautiful itself. And then... Uh, as the speaker says in that dialogue, starting out from beautiful things and using them like rising stairs so that in the end, one comes to know just what it is to be beautiful and what is that if not God himself. So then we can have a, towards God, a duty of gratitude for all he has done for us. As the psalmist says, what shall I render to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the chalice of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. We can use intersubjective presence as a kind of starting point for acknowledging God's presence. Do we have respect or disrespect, regard or disregard for God's presence? Uh, do we have equal or contrary to desires to God and to his messengers? Are we communicating to God? Are we understanding God, attempting to understand God? But now we have a, a, this difficulty again. We cannot apprehend God directly like created things. So to gain any more knowledge of God beyond some general attributes, God needs to come to us since our intellects can't grasp him. And that is precisely what happened in the incarnation, which we'll get to in the next section, but I'll pause here if there are any, any questions. Jason. Yeah, there's, there's a question back to the church. Okay. Is God present also in our love for each other, not just our love of him? Absolutely. Um, just as, as God is, is the paradigm of of presence and understanding of all kinds. God is the paradigm of love 
as well. That again will be something that we get to when we get more when we get to the uh, the conference on the spiritual life. Um, but yes, God is present in the love between us. Um, that is that's part of this this desire the the union of desires which brings the two closer together. Right. Yeah. So the the question was um, for those online about uh, the question about Christ speaking to the Pharisees about that in in heaven there will be no marriage or giving in marriage. That's right because we in heaven we have a union with one another and with God that is beyond what is achievable in marriage. Marriage is a is a type of that. It's a foreshadowing of that. Um, it's a real participation in that, uh, in 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 a certain way. But uh, that will be. And so we'll look at that next week. That's a great. That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, so the question here is about Adam and Eve's union with God before the fall. And um, because I don't want to get, I, I don't know enough, I can't say enough about that off the top of my head to answer your question, but um, I will make a, a note of that, or Jason will make a note of that for me and make sure that I come back to that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Dan, they didn't have the the basic vision of what will happen in heaven. They had preternatural, supernatural, of what will happen in heaven. They were a preternatural relationship with God. They didn't have sin. They didn't have any of our, like, sins, but they didn't have the basic vision yet. Yeah. Right. The yeah, so they did not have the beatific vision. Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, sorry. Sorry, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to ask a question, too. Yes. Um, Okay. All right. Well, if you if you change your mind, let me know. All right. Uh, any others from? Uh, okay. Good. Then now we will go on to the third wave, and this is going to be one more pass through everything we've discussed, with the infusion of a deeper faith, and we're going to start where we ended before with God, that God is everywhere. In Jeremiah, I fill heaven and earth. God says. The psalmist, again, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, ever there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. And we say in the Sanctus, holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. But now, this, and this gets back to the question, is our encounter with God like objective or intersubjective presence? Now remember, in objective presence, the object has no awareness of me. So obviously God is not like this. Now with intersubjective, we're getting closer, but there are still some key differences. Remember that my intentionality of another person can be fulfilled or empty, right? It's, it's empty if I'm just thinking about them, but not experiencing them through my senses. It's fulfilled if, I, if we are thinking about them, but, uh, and we are experiencing them through our senses. Now, is God ever absent? Is God ever absent? No, God is never absent. Anywhere that something exists, God is there. But do we experience him through our senses? No, we don't experience God directly through our senses the way we, we experience things. So this is where our, our, uh, our understanding of 
intentionality and fulfillment begins to break down. This is where the modern world has an issue with, uh, with God because it thinks the modern world thinks of God as if God is, then he must be another thing among other things in the universe. And if we, if we look in the right place, then we'll find him. Like, ah, there he is. We found him. He was in this corner over here of the universe, ruling things secretly. No, it's not, it's not like that. So how is our intentionality fulfilled? Not through the senses, but through faith. In Hebrews, the definition of faith, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Again, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. By faith, we understand that the world was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was made out of things which do not appear. Then St. John of the Cross, commenting on this passage, says, Faith, we saw, affirms what cannot be understood by the intellect. Okay? Now, we can affirm another person, their presence, because we understand them in some way with our intellect. So going on from St. John. Faith, again, he says, faith affirms what cannot be understood by the intellect. This means that faith is the substance of things to be hoped for, and that these things are not made manifest to the intellect, even though its consent to them is firm and certain. If they were manifest, there would be no faith. I don't need to have faith that you are here in front of me, right? I, I, I know that I'm experiencing you with my senses. Uh, going on with St. John, for, through, for uh, though faith brings certitude to the intellect, it does not produce clarity, but only darkness. So it is wrong for us to ever think of God as absent. That would betray a lack of faith. We might feel like God is absent, just like sometimes we can feel like another person is absent when they're right there in front of us. But that feeling is an invitation into deeper faith. And we'll have more, in, more on that in the talk on God's presence in the mystical life. In this life, our intentionality of God is always incomplete or partial. So imagine you're sitting, you're, you're standing in your kitchen, um, washing the dishes or something, as I do sometimes, and there's a window right there, and you hear a sound of some sort of animal out the, outside the window, right? I know there's an animal there, but um, I don't know exactly what it is, right? So so my experience of that animal is not adequate to its essence. I can't tell if it's a bird, if it's a squirrel, if it's a raccoon or a tiger or whatever. So um, our experience of God is something like that, right? We have some partial uh, idea of God, but our intellectual understanding of God is always going to be incomplete, even though our love for him can be complete. And again, more on that, session four uh, or three. So if we expect our idea of God to, to be fulfilled by sense experience, we're confusing the creature with the creator. We will then either demand that God give us bodily consolations before we acknowledge him. In other words, that, that we, we won't consider him to be present or uh, af affecting us unless we have some sort of you know, warm spiritual feelings or supernatural experiences of him. Or, on the other hand, we will despair and think that God is always or even sub sometimes absent. So God, now moving on to God's presence in the word of God. God is present in his word, I'm talking about the scriptures now, not as one who spoke long ago, but as one who speaks to us now. It's not like a letter that your friend wrote to you a while ago and you pulled it out because God's activity is, is constant and always the same. So if, imagine if your pastor or your bishop or the pope or some other important person were here speaking directly to you, 
rather than me, instructing you, you would absolutely listen to what they have to say, I hope. Their speech is evidence not only of their presence, but also of their intentions, of their thoughts, and of their desires, and all the more so with the Word of God. Through the Word of God, we know God's own intentions, His own thoughts, His own desires. Uh, from the, the author of the Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews, Indeed, God's word is living and effective, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates and divides soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the reflections and thoughts of the heart. Nothing is concealed from him. All lies bare and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must render an account. And again, going back to our duty towards God, to revere every utterance of the Word of God as God's present self-communication to us, to guard it even more deeply than we would regard our dearest friend or spouse bearing his or her soul to us. Now going to God's presence in Christ and the church. In the Gospel of John, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever he does, that the Son does likewise. Jesus is so perfectly united to the Father that the only things he can do are what the Father does. The Father is perfectly present to him and him to the Father. The Father and I are one, right? Uh, and again, in, in uh, the Gospel of Luke, no one knows the Father except the Son. With Christ going on about Christ, Christ is present, of course, in the body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Holy Eucharist, and the entire fourth conference will be about that. God's present in the church, in the church as the body of Christ. St. Paul, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. <clears throat> Father Sonny said in his, in his homily this weekend that after the resurrection, Christ is primarily experienced through the church. Which means that through the church, we as a church have the same unity with the Father as Christ himself does. The Gospel of John, Christ saying, I have given them the glory you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. He's speaking to the Father now. I living in them, you living in me, that their unity may be complete. Something we said was unattainable in natural intersubjective presence, right? Uh, and then the Gospel of Matthew, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Christ's presence again in the church, when we are gathered in his name. Now, God's presence in oneself. He's present not only according to nature in the ways we mentioned before, but according to grace. He is present as our maker from the psalmist. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am wondrously made. Wonderful are your works. You know me right well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. That intimate knowledge that God has of us from before we were created. We're present as the image and likeness of God that is impressed upon us. Uh, God created man in his image, in the divine image he created them, it says in the book of Genesis. He's present as the principle of our actions. From Jeremiah, I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself, that it is not in man who walks to direct his steps. The psalmist again, nevertheless, I am continually with you, you hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. In the Canticle of Zechariah, in uh, the Gospel of Luke, 
Through the depths of mercy of our God, the dawn from on high has visited us to illumine those who dwell in darkness under the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Next, God is present as knowing us, our thoughts and our actions. O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. In Jeremiah, God speaking, Am I a God at hand, says the Lord, and not a, gar and not a God afar off? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? God is present as being our desire, as the object of our operations. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to those who are false to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. God is present in spiritual consolation. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. For from me proceeds the spirit, and I have made the breath of life. Peace, peace to the far and to the near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. He is present in our knowledge, but again, indistinctly. St. Paul here. For our knowledge is imperfect and our prophecy is imperfect. But when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall understand fully, even as I have been fully understood. And from the Psalms. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. God is present to us in infused contemplation, which we'll get to in session uh, three. God is present in that we are a dwelling place for God. Do you not know, says St. Paul, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Now God's presence in others, seeing in others all that we have said of God's presence in ourselves, as actively sustaining them, having a part in his plan, being the source of many good things within them, being temples of the Holy Spirit, or at least potentially so, having God as their true ultimate desire, in others as being an occasion of God to speak to us, an occasion he planned from the foundation of the world. And then there's a privileged presence of God in the poor. He who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed, in Proverbs. And of course, Christ saying, as you did it, to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So to conclude, uh, most of what I've said is probably in some way already familiar to you, but the idea of presence at the beginning may be a new lens through which to encounter the mysteries of God. Too often our faith is great in extending to a lot of things, but weak in conviction. Our thoughts about God can be quite lofty or deep sometimes and might even give us great pleasure to consider, but as long as we do not regard his presence, we betray a lack of faith. <clears throat> 
So let's return to Mary and Martha. We have a couple episodes to, to uh, talk about here. When uh, Mary is sitting at the foot of Christ and Martha is busy washing his, or busy with the household chores and getting resentful at Mary. Martha is not attending to the presence of Christ. Mary is. She's sitting at his feet, listening to his words. What does Jesus say to Martha? You are anxious and upset about many things. One thing only is required. Mary has chosen the better portion, and she shall not be deprived of it. What good is it to attend to the household chores if, in doing so, we're ignoring the words of Jesus? Now, another episode with Mary and Martha in John chapter 11, the raising of Lazarus. Martha is the first to encounter Jesus, and she goes to Mary and says, the master is here. He is calling for you. This is the message for all of us, not just Martha, but all of creation cries out to us. The master is here. He is calling for you. Here I'm going to interject a passage from St. Augustine's Confessions, where he's seeking God. I put my question to the earth, and it replied, I am not he. I questioned everything it held, and they confessed the same. I questioned the sea and the great deep and the teeming live creatures that crawl, and they replied, we are not God, seek higher. I questioned the gusty winds and every breeze with all its flying creatures told me, I am not God. To the sky, I put my question, to the sun, moon, stars, but they denied me. We are not the God you seek. And to all things which stood around the portals of my flesh, I said, tell me of my God. You are not he, but tell me something of him. Then they lifted up their mighty voices and cried, he made us. My questioning was my attentive spirit and their reply, their beauty. Like Augustine, we can question all that we encounter with an attentive spirit regarding all things as pointing to the presence and activity of God. And the hymn tradition of Christianity speaks this much more profoundly using the beauty of poetry. All thy works with joy surround thee, earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around thee, center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea, Chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. That's from Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. And then from the hymn, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. There's not a plant or flower below, but makes thy glories known. And clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne. While all that borrows life from thee is ever in thy care, and everywhere that man can be, thou, God, art present there. So then our response should be the same as was Mary's. In the words of St. John, and when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. In the past five minutes, people have been having problems with the sound. Okay, well, I, it, did it just go out? It was kind of going in. Okay, all right. Well, uh, I'm done now. <laughs> so uh, that's it for today. Uh, any other questions uh, before we wrap up? Did any questions come in, Jason? Oh, one person just um, wanted to make sure you you repeated the, the question because ah. they came here. The okay, okay. about the formation. 
elevation of a child with education, with poetry and music, which we didn't really get. And I'm, I'm, I'm listening to what you're reading, especially the scripture, and it's really cutting my heart because we've been a far away from God. Mm -hmm. There's an absence, even though he's here. And um, it's just pretty profound, especially you know during the last year. Yeah. And um, how do we thank God for him? Because it's, it's very humbling. And how do we get back to him? I mean, turn on the TV for sure. Yeah. But there's so much wealth. And my husband's reading the prophet too, and he said, we're so far, we're so much more pagan than the Romans when Socrates and Plato were walking around. We're, 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 mm -hmm. we're bereft of the truth, beauty, and goodness. Yeah. So, Right. Yeah. So the 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 question is um, the the questioner says she's reading Plato's Republic and uh, he's discussing the importance of the and the primacy of truth, goodness, and beauty, and how essential it is to have these as the center of uh, our education, and just remarking that um, it seems that we've gone very far from that, that we've lost a lot, that it's it's not part of our formation, it's not part of our mentality. We uh, we experience an absence of God, um, and how do we recover that? And, uh, and you're right, it is in things like this. For me, it starts with, it starts with myself and my own um, recognition of God's presence in all of these ways. And, um, you know, this, this session, this first conference is just laying, laying a foundation and, and the next ones will see um, how, how in practice can we recognize God's presence in our spiritual lives, um, in our moral lives, and more deeply in the sacraments, uh, and to encounter him more in, in the most difficult times when he seems the furthest away. Um, and going from there, I think, is where we can, we, we know, we find out for ourselves where our, what our part is. We begin to regard ourselves, not as we see ourselves, but as God sees us and our own part in his plan and bringing him to others. But it has to start here. It has to start here um, with, with me. So does that answer your question? You're welcome. All right, well with that, then uh, we'll close up this one. Next week's session, we'll